Well, it's great to be here with all of you, and um, I'm very honored to be here. Um, I think this is the first time anyone from Holy Cross has been in this series, so I'm honored to uh, extend and have this partnership with our two institutions founded by the Congregation of Holy Cross, so I'm very happy to be here, very happy to talk about this uh, beloved saint. As you came in, hopefully you received a little slip of paper uh, with a QR code on there. Uh, if you're not sure how to use a QR code, uh, maybe just ask the person next to you. Um, <laughs> But uh, that's kind of a gift uh, to you uh, from me. And it's a Google Drive folder that you can access that has tons of resources on St. Louis de Montfort. So all of his writings are in PDF format on that QR code. All of his writings, including all of his hymns. Uh, he wrote 164 hymns or cantiques. Uh, three biographies, his earliest biographies that were written, uh, historical documents, and um, and uh, works of spirituality as well. And then there's a folder for some artwork too. So I thought that might be of interest to you, especially for any of the graduate students in here that could use that for maybe a paper in the future, uh, maybe with Dr. Cavadini. So make sure the slides are working as well. Great, okay. Now as someone who works in a student life at a Catholic college, pursuing doctoral studies, completing studies of um, uh, preparing for a second work of publication. Um, we just recently published a work by Henri-Marie Boudon in March, and now uh, we're working on a second one by Boudon in December. And raising three children, ages four, two, and eight months, it's needless to say that sleep can be at times lacking. My day typically starts at four in the morning with prayer and coffee, followed by a couple hours of study and work before my wife and I have to go on zone defense as soon as the kids are up and ready for the day. I promise that's my only football joke for today. <laughs> One morning, as I was retrieving the cream out of our refrigerator for either cup number two or three of coffee, it's common for me to lose track of how much coffee I drink a day, I noticed a prayer card held up to our refrigerator door by a Thomas the Tank Engine magnet. Now this was odd for me as this was not a new prayer card and I had seen it many times before. On the front of the card is an icon written by modern sacred artist and iconographer Vivian Imbruglia depicting a larger than life image of Jesus Christ surrounded by a multitude of well-known saints holding oil lamps. The image is evocative of course of the well-known parable of Matthew 25 in which 10 virgins are awaiting the coming of the bridegroom with lighted oil lamps. Five of these virgins are wise in bringing enough oil to keep their lamps burning and constant vigil for the bridegroom. The other five are foolish and leave to fetch more oil to only discover that in doing so, they miss their chance of meeting the one they were expecting. While I was yawning and languidly staring at this icon, I looked to an unrolled scroll in one of Jesus's hands and read the words, wake up the world. While I was thinking of the peculiarity that this was the first time I had ever really noticed this icon and its message, perhaps because of its, re its placement on our, our refrigerator door and being held up by an anthropomorphic steam train, <laughs> I was also struck by the statement, wake up the world. Why, I asked myself, does the world need to be told to wake up? It seems that the one thing that we do very well in our modern age is to stay awake and to put off sleep whether it be work or studies, or as my college students remind me, video games and social media, one thing that we do very well is to stay awake as much as possible and sleep as little as possible, just enough to keep going. The more I reflected on this and the colder my coffee became, I came to the realization that perhaps we do need to be awakened by something or by someone. Perhaps we are living in a present age in which we think we are awake at all hours, yet are really asleep. While our body and its senses are almost in a state of constant activity and hardly at rest, we tend to forget the reality that the human person is not just flesh, but spirit. Not simply body, but soul. Our post-Cartesian world has done more than simply dividing the unique person in two. It has, as Catholic novelist Walker Percy described, created a dreaded chasm that has ripped body loose from mind and turned the very soul into a ghost that haunts its own house. Yes, we do need to be awakened from our slumber. Wake up the world. 
These words on this scroll are connected to the multitude of saints surrounding our Lord in this icon as their lives and their unique expressions of gospel witness do in fact wake us up with the words, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall be your light. With this multitude of saints depicted in this icon, I reflected on how each of them wakes us up in different ways at times that might seem to contradict each other. I'm reminded of the gentle nudge of St. Therese of Lisieux, the little flower, whose little way of spiritual childhood brings us out of ourselves in a state of total abandonment to love itself. I'm also reminded of a saint whose nudge is not so gentle and who wakens us up like a consuming fire or a torrent of water cascading down from the mountainside, Louis Marie Grignion de Montfort. Now, I must be honest, this comparison of the little flower and St. Louis de Montfort is not mine, nor is this description of Montfort as a torrent of water cascading down from a mountainside my own. It comes from the pen of Pierre Lemay, editor of the French newspaper La Croix, who compared these two saints in an editorial published a day before Louis de Montfort's canonization in 1947. This saint who comes to us like a rushing torrent of water, Lermay writes, overturns everything not sealed with the name of Jesus, leaving us stunned, if not shocked. While these words might first come across to us as poetic exaggeration, they get to the very heart of the modern understanding or misunderstanding of St. Louis de Montfort. Those that know a little about Father de Montfort and his classic true devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, or have made an act of consecration using the Montfortian formula or method, will attest to encounters with others who have very strong negative reactions against this 18th century saint. I myself have spoken to friends, acquaintances, and colleagues over the years who share a common disdain with statements such as, too French or too Baroque. His language is too flowery or pietistic. I do not want to be a slave of anybody. Or my personal favorite, I do not prefer to be likened to worms, maggots, or slugs. While it is certainly true that the language of Louis de Montfort's writings present a challenge to our modern ears, we must ask ourselves how well we truly know the saint. In an age in which rash judgment plagues the church and feeds the fires of polarization, should we not take another look at this peculiar saint we have so easily dismissed, which is also why you're gathered here today. With the recent 75th anniversary of his canonization, and the anticipation of his 350th anniversary of his birth this January, a new opportunity is before us to examine the life of Louis de Montfort and discover or rediscover what we can learn from him. On the original marble stone that was placed over the grave of this saint was an epitaph written in gold letters. Traveler, what do you see? A light quenched a man consumed by the fire of charity who became all things to all men, Louis-Marie Grignion de Montfort. If you ask what was his life, there was none more holy, his penance none more austere, his zeal none more ardent, his devotion to Mary none more like St. Bernard. A priest of Christ, he showed forth Christ in his actions and preached him everywhere in his words, indefatigable in his, he rested only in the grave, father of the poor, protector of orphans, reconciler of sinners. His glorious death was the image of his life as he had lived, so he died. Right for God, he passed to heaven, April 28th, 1716, age 43 years. What a beautiful statement that is. While dying at such a young age and having only been a priest for less than 20 years, Louis de Montfort, did not leave this world without making a lasting impression. Following the discovery of true devotion in 1842, after it had been lost and unknown for roughly 130 years, veneration for Louis de Montfort and his little treatise on true, de true devotion spread like wildfire. It has been translated in nearly every major language on the globe and has influenced Catholics of all vocations. The popes of the modern age repeatedly endorsed de Montfort's Mariology and took him as their model. It was Pius IX who declared Louis de Montfort's Marian devotion as the best and most acceptable form. 
Leo XIII beatified Louis de Montfort in 1888, granting a plenary indulgence to those who made the Montfortian act of consecration and renewed himself the act of consecration on his deathbed. Pope Pius X continued to recommend true devotion and establish what is now known as the Association of Mary, Queen of All Hearts, which is an association of people from across the church who share in making that act of total consecration. And Pius X himself was actually a member of that association he established. Pius XI stated that he had practiced Montfort's true devotion ever since his youth, and it was Pius XII who finally raised Louis de Montfort to the altars by canonizing him in 1947. No pope, however, has been such an emphatic devotee of Louis de Montfort as Pope St. John Paul II. And this is an image of Pope St. John Paul II visiting the tomb of Louis de Montfort and Blessed Marie Louis Trichet, who we'll talk about more in France, um, as a pilgrimage site for the Holy Father, showing just how important the saint was in his life. Not only did he refer to his reading of true devotion to Mary as a decisive turning point in his life, but John Paul also took both his Episcopal and his papal motto from the saint's short form of consecration, totus tuus, I am all yours. I have also been told anecdotally by a Montfortian priest that John Paul was said to have read a little excerpt of Louis de Montfort's writings every day. Beyond his influence, on the successors of St. Peter, Louis de Montfort has influenced lay leaders such as Frank Duff, founder of the Legion of Mary, and Catherine Doherty, founder of the Madonna House Apostolate, who said that Louis de Montfort is one of the mystics of the Catholic Church toward whom the face of modern youth is turning more and more. Religious men and women like Maximilian Kolbe and Mother Teresa of Calcutta have been influenced by Louis de Montfort. In fact, I just recently found out that Colby was ordained a priest, not intentionally, on the death date of St. Louis de Montfort. So much so was Mother Teresa influenced by Louis de Montfort that the missionaries of charity in particular are required to make a 33-day preparation of consecration to Jesus through Mary during their novitiate. Now the title of this lecture is St. Louis de Montfort, Troubadour of Our Lady. Those of you familiar with this association of medieval composers and performers of lyrical poetry with the saints might be reminded of how St. Francis of Assisi has been commonly given the name Troubadour. Now while today, and I see Father Ed Andreco in here, our conventional Franciscan, is the feast day in the Franciscan calendar, celebrating the stigmata of the Troubadour of the 13th century, Francis of Assisi, we will direct our attention to the Troubadour of the 18th century, whose vagabond missionary work sent him thousands of miles on foot in his home country of France over the course of a short but surely eventful priesthood of only 16 years. Now, those present here, maybe with chains on their wrist or their ankles, can be rest assured and uh, don't have to worry. This is Saturdays with the Saints, and it is a year dedicated to Marian saints, and I promise you we will get to Louis de Montfort's true devotion to Mary. However, I would not fulfill my task if we focused only on true devotion and not in some way share with you the incredible life of Father de Montfort and the spirituality he's left for us today. Many Catholics and many who have read true devotion or have done an act of consecration are not even aware that de Montfort's writings comprise of two thick volumes, I, and I have them right here. This is volume one, all entirely dedicated to hymns. He wrote 164 hymns, totaling several thousand verses. And volume two, which is his prose works. Many of us don't know this. In fact, I have with me a massive doorstop of a book that's entirely dedicated to the spirituality of St. Louis de Montfort, a handbook on the spirituality. I don't usually read that in my spare time. <laughs> perhaps now we can uh, perhaps now can be an opportunity for many of us to give Louis de Montfort a second chance. As we move through the life of Louis de Montfort, I invite you to frequently call to mind these words from St. Paul's letter to the Philippians. Though he was in the form of God, Jesus did not count equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. This pattern of self-emptying goodness in Jesus Christ for the reconciliation of the world is the pattern of the spiritual life and the path of apostolic activity for Father de Montfort. 
it's interesting for us to first note that Monfort is not Louis's last name. Rather than using his family name of Grignion, it was dropped by Louis himself in what appears to have been an intention of not leaking himself to his family that he was actually born into, but to identify himself with the place of his baptismal birth that brought him back into the family of the church. And while only living there in Montfort for only a few short months before, or I'm sorry, following his birth on January 31st, 1673, in fact, a little side note, my, our son Louis, who's named after Louis de Montfort, was baptized on the birthday of Louis de Montfort. Louis de Montfort would continue to use the town name in his signatures in a way that constantly reminds us of his unique mission, the renewal of the Christian life through a recommitment of baptismal promises by a true devotion to Jesus through Mary. Raised in a large family of 18 children, being the second oldest, Louis' youth was tinged with sadness as most of his siblings would die before any of them reached adulthood. While his mother was known for her meekness, tender care, and filial piety, her, her, his father had a nasty and violent temper that would burst suddenly at random times. Both parents and their temperaments would play a crucial role in the development of Father de Montfort, who throughout his life would fight against his own temper and reach even the most hardened of sinners with the tenderness of a father. In his childhood, Louis was known for his piety and his ardent devotion to the Virgin Mary. While we do not know where he received this devotion, perhaps from his mother, it's plainly evident that his love for Our Lady was present even in the earliest years of his life. A common story of Montfort's childhood tells us of how the boy saint would convince his sister to leave behind her games and pray the rosary together, telling her that she would become really beautiful and loved by all if she would love God and Our Lady. I'm not sure how she took that. This, rec this recommendation of devotion to Mary, to his siblings, is also evident in a letter written to his family prior to his entrance in seminary saying, tell my brother Joseph that I beg him to work hard at his studies and he will be one of the best in his class. Tell him to that, that to achieve this, he must seek the help of the Blessed Virgin, who is his good mother. If he continues to show devotion to her, she will not fail to supply all his needs. When at the age of 11, Louis de Montfort went to study at the Jesuit College of Rennes, the capital of Brittany, his peculiar piety made him an object of ridicule and scorn with his classmates until one particular event that would change their opinion of him. Jean-Baptiste Blaine, a close friend of Louis de Montfort from Rennes and one of his first biographers, whose biography you have in that Google file, tell us of a fellow classmate of his that was so poor and was dressed so shabbily that he was the laughingstock of the whole school and had to bear their mockery. L young Louis, Blaine writes, turned a beggar for his sake and was not ashamed to ask for alms from his fellow students in order to purchase new clothes for this poor classmate. While not having collected even half of the necessary funds, Louis took this poor student by the hand to a shop in town and said to the shopkeeper, this is my brother and yours. I have collected as much as I could from my classmates to get him a decent suit. If that is not enough, it's up to you to supply the rest. <laughs> this example of simplicity and of charity, said Blaine, produced the effect. Charity bred charity. The shopkeeper gave young Lewis what he wanted and the poor student got a decent suit of clothes. The story is remarkable for another reason, but note the insistence that the young Louis Grignion chooses to go outside of himself to empty himself in what can only be defined as apostolic zeal and a burning desire for charity. This desire to follow the self-emptying pattern of Jesus Christ in the early years of Louis de Montfort is remarkable, for while he is not a priest yet or in a position to continue the tradition of the French school of spirituality, founded by Cardinal Pierre de Berulle, young Louis's experience of the Christian life mirrors the pattern common in the writers of the French school. By adhering to Jesus Christ, by being grafted onto him, Louis moved to follow Christ in this kenosis, this self-emptying abasement, and to love without limits by becoming an apostolic soul. This love for the poor and desire to live a gospel form of life is well described in the infamous story of the Bridge of Saison, in which Louis, after eight years in the College of Rennes, 
decides to enter seminary at the great seminary of Saint Sulpice in Paris, founded by another member of the French school, Jean-Jacques Ollier. In a story whose veracity is determined by the fact that it's included in every early biography of Louis de Montfort, the young 19-year-old Louis says goodbye to his family at the Bridge of Cezanne. And while telling this story is a little different in each of the biographies, they are all united in telling the reader of how Louis decides to live permanently in a state of total dependence on divine providence by giving all of his money to the first beggar he meets, to another his luggage, and to a third he finally exchanged his clothes with one of them. Whether he met three beggars on this bridge or met them after crossing the bridge on the way to Paris, which is more likely when you consider how small the bridge is, and I have a photo of the bridge right here. <laughs> it's incredibly small, and so the idea of him meeting three beggars on this small bridge, and, do, and he doesn't see the second or the third until he gets to them. Um, I, I like to think that he met them on the way. Now granted, let's not dismiss the bridge though, okay? The bridge of Cezanne becomes a powerful symbol in what takes place in which Louis de Montfort crosses into a new stage of life that is characterized by a free act of abandonment and trust. It was in this time that Louis de Montfort's life that he made a personal vow to God to live a life of total and radical poverty. Might remind you of St. Francis of Assisi. Refusing to own nothing and to be entirely dependent on God's providential care. This idea of divine providence and the radical act of living in a state of dependence on God and his care that is so central in the thought of Louis de Montfort can only be seen as a grace that worked in his life, in his heart, over the course of a lifetime to not simply see God as judge and Lord who in his wrath seeks to deal out justice on his sinful people, an image of God quite possibly given to Louis de Montfort due to his own father's violent temper, but to see him rather as a tender father and to see oneself as a son. This radical view of what we call divine filiation is not always easily discerned in Father de Montfort's writings, but is especially evident in some of his unknown hymns and letters in which abandonment to God's divine providence is intimately linked to his tender fatherhood. In a hymn titled Even Song, Father de Montfort writes, let us bless forever the Lord for his goodness Oh, what a good father, what great care he takes for us. He guards us all, sustains us all, instructs us all, forgives us all, despite our wretchedness. In a letter to his uncle following the news of the death of the founder of a seminary for poor students attached to the seminary of St. Sulpice, in Lewis was a student and unsure of how he will be able to continue his priestly education. Louis writes to his uncle, I do not know yet how things will go, whether I, where I shall stay, whether I shall stay or leave, as his will has not yet been made known. Whatever happens, I shall not be worried. I have a father in heaven who will never fail me. He brought me here, he has kept me here until now, and he will continue to treat me with his usual kindness. Now, if that's not a uh, statement of divine filiation, I'm not sure what is. We do know, however, that Lewis was able to continue with his seminary education, was ordained a priest in the year 1700. While he was denied the vocation of being a missionary in the new world, due to his formator's fear that Lewis, in his zeal to con convert the native people, would get lost in the woods and never be seen or heard from again. <laughs> Lewis went to search for work in parish missions, but was unsatisfied with the lack of zeal in the priest he worked with. With the permission of his director, Father de Montfort moved to Poitiers, where he lived and ministered in a poor workhouse called the General Hospital. His biographers tell us that when the, when the poor there first discovered Louis de Montfort praying on his knees before the Blessed Sacrament, they were so taken aback, the poor were so taken aback by his poverty, by his tattered cassock that was stitched and patched, that they took up a collection for him <laughs> that he might have some proper clothes. It's just <laughs> remarkable, just remarkable. His poverty was so real and his love for those in the workhouse was so evident that they called him one of their own. In this institution of terrible labor conditions, poverty and the degradation of human dignity, a light broke through the darkness in Louis de Montfort, whose desire to reform the general hospital led to others being attracted to this light. Marie-Louis Trichet, a daughter of the crown lawyer of Poitiers, 
and a well-established family came to, to, came to Father de Montfort in 1702 for confession, telling him of her desire to enter religious life, much to the shock and frustration of her family that would have preferred her to join some well-established monastery. Marie Louise was admitted to the general hospital, not as a nurse, not as a matron, but as a member of the poorhouse. Through her patient docility to Father de Montfort as her spiritual director and confessor, Marie-Louise Trichet waited for some time before she could be given a coarse religious habit in 1703, which is considered the founding date of the Daughters of Wisdom. How interesting it is that in this partnership of Louis de, Marie de Montfort and Marie Trichet, we have the continuing tradition of both the masculine and the feminine genius coming together to be led by the spirit in the renewal of the church we might think of some other grace-filled companions like Francis and Claire, John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila, Francis de Sales and Jane Francis de Chantal, all of whom find their source of inspiration in Jesus, the Redeemer, and his mother as the collaborator, the co-worker in the redemption. While the story of founding the Daughters of Wisdom is important for us to take some time on, what I wanna focus on more is this idea of wisdom in the thought of Louis de Montfort. It is no understatement that Louis loved to refer to God as wisdom, specifically calling Jesus Christ eternal and incarnate wisdom. He being the word of God is, according to Father de Montfort, substantial or uncreated wisdom. This notion of Christ being incarnate wisdom is essential to the thought of Louis de Montfort and his charism. For de Montfort, according to one commentator, Jesus is the wisdom of God come among human beings in order to reveal to them the fullness of the Father's design of love and teach them the true master of wisdom that he is by example and deed, the way to beatitude. The beauty of this wisdom that Louis de Montfort saw was how eternal wisdom had acted in salvation history by turning the conceptions of the worldly wise upside down. The path of incarnate wisdom, according to Father de Montfort, is one of humility, abnegation, the cross. Opening his collection of hymns, you will find several Noels dedicated to the mystery of God becoming an infant to be sung during Christmas time. Hymns dedicated to the hidden hiddenness of Christ in the blessed sacrament and hymns dedicated to wisdom crucified. It was in the cross that Louis de Montfort found great joy and consolation when time and time again, he was dismissed, shown the door and abandoned by friends and collaborators for being crazy or eccentric. After being such a sign of contradiction to the world around him and in the dark nights of abandonment came his spiritual masterpiece that next to true devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary has been considered by many to be his most brilliant and his most foundational work, the love of eternal wisdom. If there was one text I would encourage you to read in addition to true devotion, it would be the love of eternal wisdom in which Louis de Montfort writes, True wisdom is to be found not in the things of this world, not in the heart of them that live in delights. He has fixed his abode on the cross so firmly that you will not find him in this world save in the cross. He has so truly incorporated and united himself with the cross that all truth we can say is that wisdom is the cross and the cross is wisdom. Nowhere do we see this cross most present in the life of Father de Montfort than in the event known as the incident of Pont Chateau. Following a mission preached in the town of Pont Chateau, de Montfort worked with the townspeople to literally build a hill and erect a life-size Calvary as a permanent spot of pilgrimage. On the day before its solemn dedication, Louis de Montfort received word that the entire structure, hill and all, was to be demolished by the direct order of King Louis XIV after having received false information from de Montfort's detractors. To the amazement of all present at Pont Chateau, when this announcement was read were the peaceful words of Father de Montfort. We had hoped to build a Calvary here. Let us build it in our hearts. Uh, after the French Revolution, his, his community of priests actually came back and erected this, uh, this uh, pilgrimage site of Pont Chateau that you can still see today. As Christ crucified as a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, so too was Louis de Montfort a stumbling block to those in his own day and age through his poverty and his desire to empty himself completely in taking the form of a slave of Jesus Christ. Herein lies the genius of Father de Montfort's 
radical identification with the poor, and an explanation of some of his eccentricities. There are countless stories of him from eyewitnesses who attested to his wild and maddening actions, if I haven't already given you enough. Knocking at the door of a convent in which he was supposed to preach a retreat, his only response to the mother superior who asked his name, assuming he was some beggar off the streets, was, I ask for charity in the name of Jesus Christ. After being denied three times, it was only revealed to the sisters later that they turned away their retreat master. <laughs> it was too late, though. After finding him and asking for him to return, Father de Montfort refused to do so because they had denied charity in the name of Jesus Christ. Talk about a retreat there. <laughs> it was not uncommon for Father de Montfort to ask to bring a friend with him if he was invited to a wealthy person's house for dinner and for him to knock on the door with a poor person he had just met in the street saying, I have brought my friend along with me for dinner. Can you imagine if someone had done that to you for dinner time? Now, my favorite story of Father de Montfort, and this is also my favorite image of him, this uh, wonderful painting tells us of how he found a poor man lying in the town street, picked him up, this man was dying, and carried him to the nearest religious house, and he banged on the door in the middle of the night shouting, open the door for Jesus Christ. Open the door for Jesus Christ. In addition to his radical life of poverty and his identification with the poor, his love for incarnate wisdom and for Our Lady came through during the hours and days he would spend in intense prayer. And uh, in his artistic expression, not only is Louis de Montfort the author of many hymns, he also led play productions during his missions, went about the rural regions of France repairing dilapidated churches, and even carved statues of Jesus and Mary that still exist today. These are some of the statues that uh, are believed to have been carved by Louis de Montfort much more than the saint of true devotion and total consecration. Now, I promised you that we will not forget why we are here in the series of Saturdays with the Saints for a series on true devotion or uh, Saints of the Blessed Mother. All of what we have discussed, including Louis de Montfort's radical dependence on divine providence, by imitating Christ's self-emptying action in the Incarnation, his identification with the poor and his apostolic zeal is important for us at arriving at a fuller understanding of this Marian saint. As a member of the French School of Spirituality, and I don't see any of my students here. I'm teaching a class in the French School at Holy Cross, and um, I think they're taking the video recording for extra credit then. So, um, As a member of the French School of Spirituality, and as Henri Bremond, a French historian, referred to Father de Montfort as the last of the great Berulians, Louis de Montfort knows that any adoration to God must lead to and flow from an adhering to Jesus Christ through the contemplation and imitation of Christ's mysteries. One such mystery, and a mystery that is commented on in all of the writers of the French school, beginning with Pierre de Berou, and in others such as Jean-Jacques Ollier, Madeleine of St. Joseph, St. John Eudes, is the mystery of Jesus living in Mary. Jesus living in Mary. For Father de Montfort, the reality of Jesus living in the womb of the Virgin Mother is something that cannot and should not be overlooked in the Christian life that seeks to imitate Jesus Christ. As he will state at the beginning of True Devotion, it was through the Blessed Virgin Mary that Jesus came into the world, and it's also through her that he must reign in the world. For Father de Montfort, if we are to follow Jesus Christ in the manner that he came to us through Mary, it only makes sense that we should go back to him through her. The best and most practical way for this to happen, according to St. Louis de Montfort, is an act of total consecration to Jesus Christ, eternal and incarnate wisdom through Mary, by which our baptismal promises are renewed. Very much so, Louis de Montfort really anticipates the universal call to holiness that um, Lumen Gentium speaks of. I wanna to read to you briefly a passage from this um, work of his called The Secret of Mary. And uh, if you haven't read True Devotion, um, I would encourage you to start with The Secret of Mary first, which is also in your Google Drive folder. Listen to this, he's writing to an anonymous person and think about Lumen Gentium and the universal call to holiness. Chosen soul, living image of God and redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, 
God wants you to become holy like him in this life and glorious like him in the next. It is certain that growth in the holiness of God is your vocation. All your thoughts, words, and actions, everything you suffer or undertake must lead you towards that end. Otherwise, you are resisting God in not doing the work for which he has created you and for which he even now keeps you in being. What a marvelous transformation is possible, dust into light, uncleanness into purity, sinfulness into holiness, creature into creator, man into God. A marvelous, a marvelous work, I repeat, so difficult in itself and even impossible for a mere creature to bring about, for only God can accomplish this. The very creation of the universe is not as great an achievement as this. Very beautiful words from De Montfort. This maxim that St. Louis de Montfort uses over and over again to express consecration, a yesum per Mariam, to Jesus through Mary, is especially important because we have to try and understand that Louis de Montfort is asking us to seek a direct path and union with Christ. This is especially important in our modern age in which Catholics can use the word consecration quite liberally for many different devotions that can, at least not explicitly or intentionally, lead to a confusion of the different meanings behind the word consecration. A Montfortian priest and author, Father Hugh Gillespie, will comment on how our understanding of what we mean by consecration and total consecration, according to Louis de Montfort, that word there is important, total consecration, must come from these three essential questions. What is being set aside? What is the purpose? And what is the motivation? The Belgian and French priests of the Company of Mary, the community founded by Louis de Montfort, have given us a helpful analogy on what we mean by total consecration and how this is different from other forms of consecration, such as a morning offering, a parent consecrating their child to Mary at baptism, or a priest consecrating their parish to Our Lady. While these forms of consecration might be likened to us going to a bank and entrusting our savings to the bank to care and protect for it, Total consecration is as if I were giving my entire life savings to the banker saying, here, take this. It's yours now. Do with it whatever you wish. This is an act that only an individual can make and not something one can make on behalf of others. Now, it's important we do not misunderstand this as if we are disparaging or discouraging a parent's consecration of their child to marry at baptism, which we've done with all of our kids, um, or a priest consecrating their parish to Our Lady. These are all really good things, or a college president for that matter. Uh, we celebrated the solemnity of Our Lady of Sorrows at Holy Cross College, which is the patroness for the congregation. And for the first time in our college history, we consecrated the college to Our Lady, and Dr. Marco Clark and consecrated his presidency to Our Lady of Sorrows. Um, so that's all good. There's nothing wrong with that. But what Louis de Montfort is talking to us about is a total consecration. Think of the banker. Here, take everything. It's all yours. And not just everything, but everything, including, as Father de Montfort will say, our good works, the fruits of our good works, and our merits, entirely entrusting all to her and allowing her to use them as she wishes. I gotta tell you, when I first encountered this, I wasn't sure if I wanted to give over my merits to Mary. <laughs> but that told me I was indeed holding something back. This is the summation of the daily renewal of total consecration that St. Louis de Montfort recommends. Totus tuus ego sum et omnia mea tua sunt. I am all yours, O Jesus, and all that I have is yours through Mary, your holy mother. This is fundamentally an act of filial abandonment into the hands of a mother so that she might become, as the poet Gerard Manley Hopkins writes, the very air that we breathe. In concluding this lecture, I would like to draw our attention to the very end of Louis de Montfort's true devotion in which he takes the doxological conclusion of the Eucharistic prayer at mass, the through him, with him, and in him, and he applies this to true devotion to Mary so that we might do all things through her, with her, and in her, and ultimately for her through her that we might be led in all things by her spirit, which is the Holy Spirit of God. This requires us to renounce our own spirit, the spirit of the world, 
and our own views and to give ourselves up to the spirit of Mary that she might move us and direct us as she wishes, that we might do all things with her, that we might look upon Our Lady as our model whom we imitate, especially her virtues, that we might do all things in Mary who is the true earthly paradise of the new Adam where we grow in wisdom, knowledge, and are nourished by the milk of her grace and her motherly compassion. Think about that beautiful image that Louis de Montfort uses that Mary is the aqueduct through which all graces flow. Finally, Louis de Montfort will write that we must do all things for Mary since she has done all for us and for the sake of our salvation. For St. Louis de Montfort to be consecrated to Jesus through Mary and to practice true devotion, an apostolic adventure is opened up for Christians who allow Mary to be the queen of their hearts and so that Jesus Christ might reign in the hearts of all people. And I know I'm a few minutes over time, so I'm just going to conclude with the ending of the prayer of consecration to uh, Jesus through Mary, written by Louis de Montfort. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. O Virgin most faithful, make me in all things so perfect a disciple, imitator, and slave of incarnate wisdom, Jesus Christ, your Son, that I may come through your intercession and your example to the fullness of his age on earth and of his glory in heaven. Amen. St. Louis de Montfort, pray for us. Thank you.